Welcome to the Passion of Entrepreneurship. I'm Ravi Tangri, and every weekday in June, I'm bringing you an incredible entrepreneur to explore their journey and what fuels them and how they get through the challenges. And I am delighted today to have Dede Wilson with me. Hi there. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. This is so great that you're doing this. I well, I find it's just so fascinating. There's some, you know, we're, we're three quarters, two thirds of the way through June, and I'm finding, even though the journeys are very different, there's some very common themes that keep popping up with people about, uh, you know, what is it that makes you step out and be an entrepreneur, which is a lot of people would think is absolutely bonkers. <laughs> and. Yeah, at times I would agree. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. Now we'll we'll get to your your latest ventures in a little bit, but I want to start way back when and I and we were just chatting about your start as right. an entrepreneur. You started on the streets of New York City at That's ten years old. Right. <laughs> You were you with, with you had you were selling your wares. You had your own stand. Tell us about that. So um, I'm 59. So you know I grew up in the 60s and 70s. This was Greenwich Village, New York City. So really a time of very vibrant energy. And I was an only child, and I think that too might have something to do with being independent minded. I was always around adults. I felt like one of them, um, and so that could be part of it as well. And so it still is going on today. There's the Greenwich Village Art Show, which happens twice a year. And this is where artists, fine artists, sculptors and painters will uh, pay for literally an area on the sidewalk to sell their wares during this particular week. And, um, oh, and it's, um, it's a curated, I mean, you have to apply to get in. It's like a big thing. Right. And then the people who get their spots, they have the same spots year to year because people come back because they want to buy their art. So yeah, they expect them there. Exactly. Exactly. We bought a piece from you last year. Now we want to buy another piece. So I decided when I was probably around 10 um, that I wanted to make beaded jewelry and sell it on the street. And uh, my parents, for whatever reason, um, decided that it should be fine for us to take a folding table and just go set up on the street, even though people right next to me were paying, I don't know how much, you know, for their piece of real estate. And um, <laughs> it never bothered us. And I did this year after year. And I just remember my mother telling me that she forwarded me, fronted me, you know, the initial outlay for the beads and the wire and all this stuff. And then, you know, I made all this jewelry and I had signs and the whole bit. And, you know, things are like 25 cents and 50 cents and stuff like that. And I remember, and I was, I succeeded. I did sell things. And I remember after the first go round, she informed me that I had to pay her back for what <laughs> prompted me. And this hadn't even occurred to me. And I remember... I was shocked, but at the same time, I got it. You know, it was like, oh, okay, of course, that makes sense. And so I did. And then I just kept, you know, rolling over the money. And I think what I loved about it and what I've always loved about uh, the entrepreneurial ventures that I've been in um, is the personal interaction that I have. With okay. People. You know, I'm a people person. And so, this allowed me to interact with strangers and listen to them. And what are you looking for? What are your needs? Oh, I have something that I think you will like. I love that interaction of matching, you know, of listening to somebody's needs and then hopefully, possibly finding something that I've created. And I think this is the other part, um, all the entrepreneurial ventures I've been in because we're going to get to it you know now I'm in food but they all um involved a, a good deal of creativity on my part right. what feeds me and you know I'm just imagining 10 year old Dede on the street <laughs> negotiating with them what so what what do you like what and then <laughs> yeah uh-huh yeah wow that takes a huge amount of confidence at that age 
I and I loved it. Like I said, I loved it. And then and so I had my same spot year to year. Right. So so that was how you started out, but then you went uh, off to college and were yeah, thinking can, you would. I can connect the pieces pretty easily for you. I mean, I always love writing, you know, all throughout grade school, high school, writing uh, again, creative outlet um, was something that I loved. And so when I entered college, I thought I wanted to do journalism. And so I did okay. that for about a year and a half. And then I got a little bored. And then I dove into a pretty heavy sort of pre-med intense science uh, thing for about a year and a half. And then I got bored with that. And so the math isn't going to quite add up because I ended up taking a little longer. It was four and a half years, really. So right. I took some time off at that point. And so here's the first big epiphany. Um, okay. I had grown up in New York City. I had gone to private schools. I had gone to college. Education was always very important to my parents. And so now here I was saying, I need to take a semester off. I don't know what I want to do. And that was when I started really thinking about, oh, you know, I'm going to finish school and then my life's going to start. I think a lot of young people kind of feel that way. Maybe right. more, but certainly back then. And, um, I said to myself, well, Danny, what do you like? What do you like doing? What gets you excited every day? What makes you happy? And food, this is where food came in. I thought, well, I've always loved cooking and baking. And my parents were amazing cooks, not professional, but they were really good cooks. My palate was pretty sophisticated. Uh, and it was like this light bulb moment. It wasn't that my parents had ever dissuaded me from following something that was more avocational it's right. just it never came up which <laughs> looking back i think was a real disservice to the child who was me um i think um it was always expected that something was going to be more academic and so i talked to my parents and i talked to people at school i went to hampshire college everything was um independent oriented anyway mm -hmm. and we talked about this and so i ended up going back to school and really kind of doing an independent study that was more on restaurant management and food okay and i actively managed a cafe you know at the school it was it was very hands-on and academic at the same time and then I graduated 11 days before I had my first daughter. <laughs> my daughter. So Just slide it in. That's right. So in fact, my one of my my sons asked me for a picture. I said, "There's no picture. I didn't fit in anything. I was wearing sweatpants at my graduation." So anyway, I had my daughter. I took a few months off and then I was like, "Okay, I'm now out of school and it's time for me to enter the real world and work. And what am I gonna do? And uh, pastry and desserts had always been my, my sort of sub passion of- Right. And I decided I was just going to try to enter the, the professional world of kitchens. And if I could get a job, I would take it as a sign that I just needed to jump right in. And if I couldn't get a job, I would take it as a sign that I needed to go to culinary school. So I lied my way into my first job. And what did you say? So a fine dining restaurant was advertising mm -hmm. for a pastry chef. And I went over there and they said, do you make your own puff pastry? And I said, of course. And that was a complete lie. And they said, well, it was a Tuesday. And they said, come back on Thursday and bring something made from your own puff pastry and bring us something really chocolatey. And now this is, this is another thing, okay? So why did I do that? I'm not a liar. I really don't, like that's not my MO. I knew I could deliver. I knew I could deliver. So that, that's where that was coming from. So you had um, that confidence in you that I you could get there. Knew it. I knew it. Because that's what oh. I did all the time. I was constantly making things I had never made before. I mean, that was what I liked to do. That was like my, you know, my fun, uh, challenging myself with new things. 
So I, you know, dove into Julia Child, uh, Master of the Art of French Cooking, followed her recipe, to this day, made the best damn puff pastry that I have ever made. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, got the job. So I got the job. And that's how the thing started. And, you know, I, I had that job for six months. Then I went to another job that was like a little bigger, a little more important. Then a friend of ours was opening up a scratch bakery and deli. And this is where the, the true entrepreneurial stuff really kicks in. He was opening this business and uh, my current partner, uh, who I hope is watching, hi Robin. Robin Baffin and I uh, joined Nick Seaman here in Amherst, Mass. And he was opening the Black Sheep Deli and Bakery. This was 1986. Okay. And none of us had owned a store, run a store. Like this was all new. I mean, we all had some experience. He had made bread for somebody else. I had made pastries for someone else. Robin had run a cheese department, you know, at, at various locations. But this was going to be our store. And so we did everything. So even the bread for the deli was made from scratch. And we just dove in and worked incredibly hard and uh, loved every moment of it. And it's still flourishing to this day. Um, okay. I think that was my first taste of really understanding that you can have a desire to do something. And if you have a passion for it and you're surrounded by other people so that you can support each other and help each other, not just physically, but emotionally, psychically, um, you know, right. we were all in. Because that's the tough thing for a lot of entrepreneurs is they may hire a team, but it is their business. And sometimes you know, that, that can be a very isolating experience because you don't necessarily have the support that, that you guys did. Well, not only that, but, you know, to fast forward, Robin is still my partner today. So, mm -hmm. so that was 1986. Robin and I were together at the Black Sheep until 90, I think like 1990. Then she and I opened a bakery together also in town, did that for a few years. Then I had my twins things were too much, we closed the bakery, and then Robin and I took a 20 year hiatus. Okay. From one another, not because anything had ever gone wrong, but it's just like, that's what happened. She right. actually went in a non-food direction. That's when I drove back into my writing and started writing for newspapers, decided I wanted to write my first cookbook. Um, my second cookbook brought me to Bon Appetit magazine. Then I was with Bon Appetit for uh, 15 years, uh, all during that time, writing more cookbooks, writing more cookbooks, writing more cookbooks. And all that time was suffering with irritable bowel syndrome. So okay. this is this is the this is sort of the pivot point. And and all of that time, that was you know, your whole focus, that was the Bakerpedia, the, the focus around all baking and the desserts and so on. Right, but even before, well, well I'll mention Bakerpedia in a moment, so, but food, okay, so basically from 1985, as soon as I got out of college, I was working with food, right? First in a very practical way as a pastry chef, owning a bakery, running a deli, then, mm -hmm writing cookbooks, mostly focusing on desserts. Then when we first uh, met one another about seven years ago, I had just started bakerpedia.com, which obviously was more dessert and uh, uh, sweets focused. But the point is that it was food, food, food. And this is what I loved. It is what just, you know, literally fed me creatively, creative, creatively. <laughs> I, have, I was suffering with irritable bowel syndrome. That's what IBS is, which mm -hmm. in five people worldwide have IBS. That and astonished me when mm -hmm. I, I heard that number. Regardless of their diet and culture. And no one knew but my immediate family. So here I was trying to work with food every day and a lot of times being really sick, painfully sick. Um, so 2015, I had a real health crisis, real crisis, uh, ended up in the hospital three times that spring. Um, it was really bad. They were trying to figure out what was going on. Pancreat pancreas was involved. Liver was involved. Right. Stuff is going on. And, uh, I was introduced to this thing, 
uh, it, it was, it's so interesting how the world brings you things. I mean, I, I feel that that happens. So I'm in the hospital. I trust that. I'm, I'm in, I'm in this horrible pain, literally wanting to die. That's how bad the pain was. Had these conversations with my husband, literally saying, I don't, I can't, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here if I'm in this pain. And now here's this GI, this gastroenterologist, not mine, just mm -hmm. happenstance of who was on call. Yeah. And he, you know, they got me stabilized and he said, look, you know, there's some acute stuff going on here and we have to figure out what it is. But once we get you stabilized, I want to readdress your IBS because if you're still having the issues that you're having, um, there's more to be done. We need to okay. figure this out. And I was thinking, yes, yes, I, I agree. <laughs> um, I don't ever want to be in this pain again. And he said, I want you to look into something called the low FODMAP diet. And I said, what? And he <laughs> spelled this acronym. So it is an acronym, F-O-D-M-A-P, uh, on a piece of paper. And he handed it to me. And this is in the hospital. And he said, it's a new diet, it is clinically proven, meaning it's not a fad, it's coming out of researchers in Australia, not so much known in the US yet, a lot of misinformation out there on the internet, only pay attention to what's coming out of Monash University. And he said, okay. and download their app. So I, I'm laying there in the hospital bed and you know, during the previous 24 hours, they'd gotten me stable and I was crying, you know, to my husband saying, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? My entire life is food. It's what I do for a living. It's what I love and I can't do it anymore. I mean- And now here it handed on a platter to you. But I didn't know at the time, right? Yeah. But exactly, that's what was about to happen. I was thinking that my career was kaput. And I was thinking, what? Well, I didn't know what I was like. I was in one of those desperate times where you're saying, you know, how am I going to make a living? How am I going to feed myself? What am I going to do? The only thing I've ever done is food. So now I have this thing written on this piece of paper and I do what he said. And I go look at this smartphone app um, that Monash University had created. So FODMAP stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. And that's why there's an acronym. Um, all those things are carbohydrates. And what, okay. they're, what the scientists had figured out was that up to 75% of the one in five people in the world who have IBS, that up to 75% of people, if they go on a diet that is restricting and monitoring these FODMAPs, that they could be free of symptoms. I mean, it was a very dramatic okay. concept and statement. And at first, I didn't believe it at all. I was saying to myself, I'm an educated person. I'm in the food business. I have access to healthcare. I've never heard of this thing. What the heck is this thing? You know, it just, it, I couldn't believe it actually. Yeah. So I went and looked at the app. And so what they had done is they've taken hundreds of foods into the lab and they've put them through lab testing to establish what these FODMAP, literally these molecular levels right. are in different foods so that they could come up with a diet. And it's weird. So things like a quarter cup of blueberries will keep you within a certain threshold and is considered okay. But a yes. half a cup of blueberries is not. So it's not black and white. It is very portion dependent. Mm -hmm. And it's weird. So like blueberries have this weird, like high, low thing, strawberries, you can eat those in much greater portion. Blackberries are a, a tighter uh, um, level than, than blueberries. So you can't tell by looking at a food. So you need this app. So I'm okay. looking at this app. And this is where my entrepreneurial sort of creative brain um, lit up. You know, so I've been sitting there thinking, what am I going to do? My career is over. 
and I'm really sick and we still don't know what's going on yet, but the doctor said, I think this low FODMAP diet's gonna help you. And now I'm looking at this app and on this app are just lists of foods, lists of foods, lists of foods. And next to blueberries, you know, there's a red light because in a one cup serving size, it's not okay. And next to carrots is a green light and carrots are okay. And I looked at this and I immediately realized that the average person would look at this list of food and see what they couldn't eat and would right. look at it as restrictive. And because my thing is developing recipes, I immediately saw potential. I saw what was possible. I saw ways I could take these foods and combine them and create dishes that were still within the low FODMAP protocol. And I said to myself, you know, I bet that's not going to be the average person's uh, experience. Yes. So I was in the hospital for five days. So at that point, I was pretty stable. So I spent a lot of time just looking at my phone. And in 2015, the only people talking about the diet were either the uh, were either Monash University, so it was very academic information. Yep. And then there were a few registered dietitians, including a few here in the States that were talking about it, but all of the information was pretty dry. You know, it was pretty scientific, academic. It was not about how food is delicious and sexy and fun and creative. And that's where I had been coming from. Okay. And all of a sudden I thought, oh my God, you know, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the part of this diet that's not being um, celebrated and attended to and worked on. And I, um, so Robin and I, had not seen each other in 20 years. We literally, we live right around the corner. We had not run into each other or anything. So, so I, you hadn't been in contact in that time even. You just really drifted out of each other's worlds. And I go to bed one night and I had a dream. And in this, <laughs> in this dream, so we used to run a catering business together at the Black Sheep. And I was, I was very involved with the catering. So in this dream, I'm in New York City and I'm organizing a catering gig and I'm running through Times Square and Times Square is as frenetic mm -hmm. as you know you can imagine it and I'm frenetic because there's something that I have to get and I don't know where to get it and I'm going to be late and I'm trying to get to the you know the, the catering location and everything's going to be you know laid and I, I'm panicked and I'm racing through Times Square and I see Robin and she's standing there and she's like she's calm and she's just kind of looking up at all the you know the flashing billboard that you know people don't do that in times square everybody's moving and she's just and it was really weird and so i woke up that morning and i said to my husband i was like i i need i need to get in touch with robin so i had an old phone number tried it didn't work i said i bet i can find her on facebook so I message her on Facebook and I'm like, hi, I had a dream about you last night. I would love to connect. So this is where it gets really good. So <laughs> her partner at the time was being um, interviewed by my ex-husband to do some carpentry work. And her boyfriend said to her, how do you know Harry? And she's like, oh, Harry was my friend Day Day's ex-husband. And they're laying in bed early that morning and she's telling her partner all about me. This is who Day Day is. This is what we used to do together, da 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 da. And then she goes on her phone and sees she has a Facebook message and it's from me. And we're both like this. And so she's like, oh, I need to get in touch with Day Day. Yeah. He's going on here, right? So we connect and then we're like we have to get together in person so we get together in person and we're doing catch up right and she said to me well you know why your dream was the way it is and i was like no why was my dream the way it was and she's like because that's that's what i'm doing right now she said i'm taking time off i retired from my work i've been taking time off just to become 
collected and figure out what I want to do next. And I've been gardening and spending time outside and with my dogs. And she's like, that energy that you saw in the dream, that's exactly what I've been doing. So then I said to her, okay, well, this is crazy, but let me tell you what's going on. She's like, okay. You know, I've, I've, been food. I've been doing all this food stuff. I recently got sick. I have this idea for a new business. Um, no one knows what this thing is yet. Here in the United States, we would be above, we would be ahead of the curve. Um, but I think there's a business here because this is not a fad. It's a clinically proven diet. I gave her the numbers of the 41 million people in the US alone that have IBS, that 75% of them could um, be symptom free if they knew what to eat and that I wanted to help them know what to eat. And I wanted them to understand that they could eat well, that it didn't just have to be the foods that were like being put forth by the, the researchers. Right. So, you know, because, you know, and then the branding, the branding was another sort of, I think, entrepreneurial light bulb moment. So our website is fodmapeveryday.com. And the way that came to me was when I was thinking about what I wanted to do. Oh, and I should say, in the meantime, I got out of the hospital, I started going on doing the diet for myself. And I went from 25 years of having three to four bouts of IBS a week and taking medicine to having zero uh, bouts a week and going off all the meds. So it is. In how much time did that take you? I knew in the first few days that this would okay. work. And by the end of a month, I was like, I'm going to stake all of my business, all my time, all my time and my energy on building a business. In about a month, I made that decision. But I was willing. Because you to had that experience. Exactly. Exactly. So. It was really interesting. I was telling Robin, you know, my experience, I was telling her the numbers, why I thought, and the timing, right? The fact that we were ahead of the curve here in the US. But what I thought was so interesting is that she said to me, I'm taking time off from work because I'm trying to figure out what I'm gonna do next. And whatever I right. do next, I need to support myself. I need to be able to make money. I want it to be interesting. I wanna learn new things every day. And I want to help people. And I said to her, I believe we can check off all of those boxes. Yeah. And, you know, going back to the whole team thing, you know, this is where maybe I'm not going to be of much help. Help. Robin and I speak locally at a lot of at the colleges and people are often asking who are solopreneurs, you know, and they're asking about well, how do I find, how do I find a partner? And, you know, here's the thing. She and I had had two businesses together. We've lived together. We even went out with a couple of the same guys at various times. So, you know, we're coming from a place of being, um, not only knowing each other really, really well, but trust, trust. You, you can't, what I would say to someone listening to this right now, let's say you need a designer or let's say you need a tech person of some sort, or let's say you need a right. business advisor. You know, there are these, there are these categories, right. Of things that you don't do well, or you need help with. And so you need to find one of those people. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're looking for creative or whether you're looking for tech or whether you're looking for finance or whatever the heck it is. If you have a gut thing where you're gut like, Oh, I don't know. I don't know about this person, but they, they're supposedly really good at what they do. Listen, you have trust to trust the gut. That. You have to, you have to, did you have no. that experience? I live by my intuition, even if the facts say the opposite, I'll go with intuition all the way. Exactly. And that's been, that's absolutely been uh, my experience. I mean, you know, we slid into it a little because we first got together when we were much younger, the stakes were not as high. We didn't have mortgages at the time and all that right. stuff. But, you know, looking back, we, we understand why it worked. 
And and the other thing is, you know, work ethic. I mean, both of us, um, it was really interesting. So, you know, I brought this business idea to her and she said, uh, you know, she was intrigued. Mm -hmm. And she said, but this is your baby day day. So you've got to figure out if you're bringing me on, what percentage is it? She goes, this has to be your decision because she didn't want to press me and in any which way, which I thought was really, really gracious. And then um, we had a mutual friend who is an entrepreneur uh, in the pharmaceutical uh, arena. We didn't know that we both knew him. And then we found that out and we thought he would be a really good sounding board. And so we went out to lunch, we took him out to lunch and he looked at the two of us and he said, oh no, this is obvious. He goes, I know both of you, this is 50-50. And as soon as he said that, we knew it was true. And I think that what's important about this or what's interesting to me about this is that if you read a lot of entrepreneurial books, a lot yeah. of people say 50-50 is for neophytes. 50-50 is when you don't really know what the heck is going on. Nothing is ever 50-50. You know, you got to do the hard work, figure out you know, who's doing the 70 and who's doing the 30 or the 60, 40 or the 51, 40, like, I don't know. But you'll often read that 50, 50 is, is just like the, the wimps approach or the, well, or people the aren't willing to have the tough conversations to say, you know, who's really bringing more. And maybe that's it. Right. So it's like a default. And mm -hmm. so in our instance, we knew each other. And we knew that um, if I was going to be mostly focusing on um, content creation, um, I do I do the recipe development, I do interviews, I do our photography, I you know I delve into the science stuff. Robin is doing tech, she's doing business, she's doing PR, she's handling social media. But both of us knew that, and because we knew who the other was, we both knew that each part was as important as the other that this wasn't about how many hours did you work today how many hours did you work today right we knew that we could trust one another to work our butts off and we would not have to micromanage each other and that was our agreement and i did vo i did vocalize that to her because there had been that 20 year separation and i said you know i've been working on my own now for years and the one thing that I, I don't want to get into is I don't want to get into a micromanic thing where I'm like, well, I'm starting work today at eight and I'm not getting off the computer until five. And what did you do? I just, we're each going to have our jobs of what we need to do. And I know that I can trust you to do what you need to do. And I need you to try. And she's like, absolutely. Absolutely. She goes, that's yeah. exactly what I'm looking for and what I need. And so for us, it works perfectly, but it's because the trust is there and because we both know each other's work ethic. Right. And, and, and I think, you know, that, that's a big thing, that trust. And it's back to, if you, as you said, if you've got that squirmy feeling in your gut, then you've got to have more mm -hmm. conversations. Or, well, I, or I walk. You can get beyond that. I don't think yeah. conversations solve. Well, I mean about even like a 50, 50 conversation, if that feels wrong, you know, you may still have a feeling that it's the right person, but it's the 50-50. You feel it's not fair, but you don't know how to bring it up. You need to have that conversation. Right. So you spent a lot of years as a solopreneur. In between. Not very successfully. Okay. No. So you you really found that it makes that diff that much difference having that having the your sort of your soulmate in in business with you you know what it is i mean do i think it, it, it's time in the day i mean part of it comes down to time in the day um there are many things that robin does that i could do there are many things that i do that robin could do then there's a portion of what she does that I can't do. And there's a portion right. of what I do that she can't do. But even that overlap stuff, as it is, you know, 24 hours in the day, like I don't have time to do it all. I just don't. Um, now, of course, we're talking about an online, um, I call FODMAP every day our mothership 
That's that's yeah. the that's the um, the focal point of our brand, right? So we're digital, yeah. we're food based. Um, for other businesses, this might be different, but I'm speaking to you know our situation. I'll give you a perfect example. Um, there's someone in New Zealand who's created a product um, that is low FODMAP compliant. And I ordered some to play with it in the test kitchen and I love it. So we have uh, promotional packages that we offer people, you know, and we tailor to uh, individual brands needs. But so let's talk about how we make money first. So we make money because all the content on the website is free. So we make money with advertising, we make money with sponsored posts, we make money with affiliate programs, those are the, the big categories. Right. So we have promotional packages that outline the kinds of things that we can do with people that can range from doing a Facebook Live interview with them to creating recipes for them and doing a whole social media thing. They can have banner ads on the top of the site. I mean, there's all these different things that we can do for people. Um, but when we reach out to somebody, you know, we have to have our current media kit, all the stats have to be yeah. you know, perfect, blah, 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 the thing that I sent to you. So Robin does that. So so for instance, I, I we have this person in New Zealand, I got the product, I, I found the product, I ordered the product, right. I put the product into the test kitchen. I played with it. I started formulating ideas about uh, ways that we could help promote this. I made some recipes. I took the photos. I edited the photos. I created an example recipe of an example of the kind of way that we could showcase this person, right? Right. So now I said to Robin, I'm ready to reach out to this person. She writes our writes the letters gets the media kit together make sure you know that all the analytics are like in a row he wrote back to us he said i need some specifics about your australian and new zealand uh demographic she's like i'm on it i don't have time for that i don't have the, you know this is an example of something like i could do but i don't have the time and i don't have the bandwidth you know if i'm really trying to focus on um creating some gorgeous dish with this person's food and taking photos of it and choosing props and backdrops and blah 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 that's like the opposite well <laughs> it's not joy for you too well it's not exactly Exactly. It's not just the, can you do it? It's you've got to, you know, a lot of people say play to your strengths. I think, yes, play to your strengths and it's got to be your joy. Right. And Robin is, you know, like when we had our bakery, I was in the back. She was front of house and she was, you know, uh, organizing the employee schedules. Uh, she kept the books. You know, this is what Robin's really good at. She's really good at being organized and structured and making sure everything is where it needs to be. And so, you know, we are so blessed that we have one another and there's this dovetail um, because, you know, with Bakerpedia, when I, the time that we met and I was trying to create this online presence that was all focused on baking and dessert and my head was where it naturally goes, which is to all the recipe creation. The foods, yeah. And then stuff like this would come up. Well, day day, how are you gonna make money? You gotta start reaching out to potential sponsors and you gotta write those letters and you gotta get, you know, when was the last time you looked at your analytics and studied what was going on? And I couldn't, I really couldn't do it all. Well, you used a perfect analogy with the last time you and Robin worked together. Like if you were a restaurant, the chef is important and so is the business side right. of running it. Right. And a lot of times people argue one or the other is more, but really you need the both to make it work. For some reason, I just thought of food trucks. You know, I'm thinking, you know, again, it depends on the structure of your business. If you want to do something completely hands on and you're in food, then, you know, try and figure something out, something out that will speak to your strengths and you enjoy doing and that you can handle. But, you know, we 
knowing the numbers of people that need to be helped uh, with this diet, knowing that we were way ahead of the curve and there was going to be, uh, I mean, we were going to, we, we launched with a very wide net cast. Yeah. We had to see who is going to be, uh, end up being our demographic. Now we were a little crazy. Um, we, when we pulled back the curtain and launched the site, we had a hundred recipes. We had a hundred recipes and I don't know how many articles we had. So speaking about team, Robin and I run FODMAP every day, 50, 50, and we have this wonderful, you know, um, synergy with one another, but neither of us is a medical professional and this is a medically directed diet. And so from the get go, before we launched, we said to ourselves, we want a team of registered dietitians that yep. work with us, that write the articles that are science-based, that hold up. You know, Data is going to be doing all this creative, sexy, fun food stuff, but we still have to keep it grounded in what this right. directed diet is. And uh, Robin came up with the great term. We call them our success team. Um, and so we have this success team of RDs. And the way we assembled our team was we, well, first we wanted to find people that were um, in very different factions, right? So we wanted to find someone who was focusing on vegetarianism and the diet. We wanted to find somebody who was knowledgeable of the diet, but was focusing on maternal health. We wanted to find somebody that maybe was coming from a more integrative medical perspective. So um, their own niches. Their own niches, right. And now, let's see, we also have someone who's based in Luxembourg. We have someone who focuses on um, uh, plant-based nutrition, and she's also an endurance athlete. So there's, like, all these different people. But the way we yeah. found them was, you know, we said, okay, well, these have to be registered dietitians that uh, understand the low FODMAP diet so that immediately, you know, we had – it was easy – to find who those people were. And then we said, we're gonna look for people who don't have their own major online presence. Mm -hmm. Maybe would like to ha be part of a team um, where they can get a boost for their own work. And right. we approached all of these, It ha they happened to all be women that wasn't by direction, there's very few male RDs in the U.S. Right. Currently. The diversity thing is actually huge for us right now because we've been trying to be more diverse from the get-go in all ways, and it hasn't been that easy. But anyway, we, we reached out to these women and we said, our goal is to become a place where, you know, someone goes to the doctor and the doctor says, you need to try this diet. We want them to find us immediately. And we want to be this springboard to everything low FODMAP. So they're gonna to come to our website. They're gonna find recipes. They're gonna find articles about, you know, what if my, um, my, my teenager is about to leave for college? How can I yeah. help them follow the diet? They're gonna find articles on, I'm an endurance athlete and I also have this, what do I do? Um, and we said to them, Initially, we said, we don't have any money. Um, our idea is that you write an, an article every now and then, and then we promote the heck out of you. And you can use the articles to promote yourself. We will try to funnel people towards you for you know your personal uh, private practices. And they all said yes. <laughs> and that's another really big thing, okay? You do not know unless you ask. This is such a huge thing in, in an entrepreneurial yep. world. I think people are, and right, it comes up on so many different levels. Like you're afraid to ask somebody for a favor. You're afraid to ask somebody uh, if they wanna be part of your team. You're afraid to ask somebody for a critique on a design you have for a website or a product or right. whatever it is. We have questions. Entrepreneurs have, entrepreneurs have questions. And sometimes you're afraid and to ask and it's like okay well why are you afraid well probably afraid because you think the person's gonna say 
that's no good. You got to go back to the drawing board or whatever. But first of all, that's going to be really helpful information. But mm -hmm. the real thing I'm getting at is you will get more yeses and you will get more positive feedback that you could ever imagine. And you're not going, you're cheating yourself out of that experience, right? Yep. You don't, you don't know how many people are going to go, Oh my God, I love what you're doing. And you know what? I have this idea that I want to bring to you and it could become this additive thing where they're then there, you know, you thought you were asking something of them and then all of a sudden they're bringing something to you and offering it up. <laughs> I mean, this stuff happens all the time. It does, but you've got to open the door. Yeah. I think a lot of people are afraid of the nose. Yeah. Right. Right. And then um, somehow I never answered the thing I started before about the branding. I just want to mention that for a moment because I think branding is something that comes up for everybody. Right. Totally. So for me, and it's misunderstood by a lot of people. Right. So, you know, unfortunately, we're dealing with this horrible acronym, um, but it is what it is. And there was no getting around that. So, you know, FODMAP was just something that we had to make peace with early on. Um, but as I thought about how the diet was working for me and how I wanted it to help our proposed hopeful demographic, our users. I said, all right, so people are gonna wanna know what they can make for breakfast as they're running out the door. And they're gonna wanna know what they can pack for lunch for themselves or for their child. And they're gonna wanna know what they can make for dinner for their family when maybe the dad and the daughter are on the diet and the mother and the yeah. son or whatever the configuration is. And so I thought, this is about how people are going to interact with the diet on an everyday basis. And then it was just automatic. It was like- Every day. Yeah, that was it. And it was, Bakerpedia was the same way. Bakerpedia was actually, um, <laughs> I know you won't think this is weird, but, um, and probably they, since they're your audience, they won't think it's weird either. Um, as I was trying to think about what I was gonna call this brand and website that was gonna be focused on desserts and sweets, um, I literally was sitting in my living room one day. It was this, it was this stormy day and it was gray and I was alone. I was sitting in the living room and I'm not kidding you. I literally physically felt something hit my head to the point where like I thought, I thought there was, I don't know, a bug, a bird. I don't know what I thought, but I literally physically had this jolt and the word Bakerpedia entered my brain. So I grabbed the phone. I literally, I grabbed the phone and I think it was GoDaddy. And I called one of the, one of the services. I'm pretty sure it was GoDaddy. And I said, I mean, literally, like I'm talking about like within 20 seconds, right? I pick up the phone and I said, can you tell me if this URL is available? And I love it when you had a call to ask. <laughs> I, I'm way out in the sticks. We had no high speed. There was no way I could, it would take me forever. So I called and it was a guy and I asked him and he said, yes. And then he said to me, you know, this is what I do all day long. And I got to tell you, that's an amazing <laughs> URL. And I said, well, let me tell you what my intention is to do with it. Right. So then I explained to him and he's like, oh my God, like the two of us, I don't know this person. Right. And the two of us are like, oh my God, oh my God, like, this is amazing. So, you know, I think I bought, I don't know, I bought like eight different, you know, it was yep. like, .com, dot or like, I don't know. I was like, throw them in the cart, just, you know, buy them. So, you know, branding is a funny thing, but I think that, um, when it's right, it will feel, you know, again, that sort of gut thing, right? Yeah. It, it has to totally. explain what you do. I want it to, well, you know, it's funny though. You know, you have something like goop. I mean, there are plenty of things that like mean nothing. Yeah. They're wildly successful. And so you can't say that doesn't work, but because what I'm doing, especially with FODMAP every day is very practical and, and there's the medical aspect. Um, we wanted it to say what it was. Yeah.
So that you know, I, I wish we could have the time to go into this, but I love how you use intuition. You dance with synchronicity. You're not locked into strike. You you love those coincidences because I think that there that that's where the energy comes from. I, I I think we could go through another hour just into that. I have a feeling okay. because it's 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 uh, I'm hearing it through all of your stories. But I do want to make sure people know that this is the uh, that's the website right to get a hold of you and. Uh, and it's, it's as I say, I am just shocked when when you say that's one in five. It's one in five, and you know, if people go to the website, you can also find us on Instagram and Facebook, and you know, our presence on Twitter is like this. Um, and we have some videos on YouTube. Um, when you go to the website, you're going to see delicious food, amazing food, and this is you yeah, know, what I want to say is. to people. You know, this is. Irritable bowel syndrome is uh, common, and there's something that for 75% of you could help you immensely. Um, while, yeah, more of the food pictures are more up top. These are all. Yeah, them. they are up. Those are all the articles um, you were saying, but the food yeah, pictures here. Right. Oh, go go further up. Wait, wait. No, oh, I was just clicking on food. Oh, okay. Oh, these are like, like that's, buns, these cinnamon buns today, sticky buns, that's noodles and pork. I mean, this is about, this is not going to be about deprivation. This is going to be about learning a new way to approach your diet. Um, but we will help you not feel uh, deprived. And just imagine, I mean, if you are somebody suffering with IBS, can you imagine being pain free and eating well? I'm telling you, there's light at the end of the tunnel. It can be done. The diet is meant to be uh, followed along with the help of a registered dietitian. Um, we pound that note home all the time, but you know, you're not with your dietitian 24 seven. So that's where um, a website, a brand like FODMAP every day can help support, support you. So Dede, I got to thank you so much for joining me. This has been a delight. Like I say, I wish we could, and maybe we will one day go on into that side of it about uh, trusting the flow and the synchronicities. Absolutely. I would be more than happy to come back. Well, I hope, I hope uh, your community enjoyed this. I did, and I think it's great that you're doing this. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was so so much fun for me too. And also the other thing I do want to mention and for the business owners that are watching, this Wednesday is the one day this month where I'm not doing a, um, a passion of entrepreneurship show. That's because we're putting on an online conference called Leadership Rx. Uh, and it is about how do you lead and support yourself and your team through these crazy times to move forward with an incredible panel and and this is completely different from zoom or go to or anything that you've tried it's it's really like being at an online uh, at an in-person meeting where you're learning from each other so if you're interested uh come to leadershiprx.com all the information is there and tomorrow i will be back with the passion of entrepreneurship look forward to seeing you thanks for joining me thank you so much Dede. thank you We'll see you tomorrow.